Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the description of the malt. And as we read, I want you to, I'm going to point out some things. And as we're looking at them, I want you to think about how this either supports or is the opposite of what he should be doing as a monk. Remember, their vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Okay, so if we look at this first little bit, you're going to notice that it says hunting was his sport. See this right here? Hunting was his sport. Well, if you go and you look, down a little bit further, it says, and I'm going to underline this too, it says, he did not rate that text to the point 10, which says that hunters are not holy men. All right, so whatever, in, this is kind of like a little saying, I don't rate that text to the point 10. That means I don't think anything about it. I don't care about it. It's not important to me. So he's saying that that text is not important to him. The one that says hunters are not holy men, plus hunting was his sport. So if hunters are not holy men, and that's what the text says, and by text they mean the rules. So if the rules say that hunters are not holy men, yet hunting is his sport, then he is breaking... His vow of obedience. So he's breaking his vow of obedience. All right, so next thing. Um, he is the prior of the sale. Now, Keep in mind that, all right, keep in mind that just like the nun was the prioress, the head nun, a prior is a leadership, it's a leadership position. And this is important because uh, remember what I told you with the nun is that, you know, you didn't just become a leader in a monastery or a convent. So he has been doing right, or he has some way made his way into a leadership position. Okay, so next thing. And this is probably one of the most important pieces of information that you're going to get. So this part that I just put a box around, this proves to us that he does not... follow the rules. So he's not following the rules. It says the rule of good St. Bennett or St. Mar. Now St. Bennett and St. Mar wrote the rules that monks were supposed to follow. They wrote, wrote everything that the monks followed in terms of what they should and should not do. But it says that those rules were old and strict. So he tended to do what? Ignore them. Then it says he let go by the things of yesterday and took the modern world's more spacious way. Now, letting go by the things of yesterday to take the modern world's more spacious way means that he wanted to be able to do things um, in today's time and to not go back and, and think about the old way of thinking it. Okay, so the next little bit says a monk uncloistered is a mere fish out of water. Now you have to you have to also pair this with this right here. It says so this is kind of like saying that he did not 
rate that text that are plucked in that says a monk uncloistered is a mere fish out of water. So put those two together, kind of get out the um, hunters are not holy men, which we looked at earlier, because this is also, so it's both of those things. Hunters are not holy men, and a monk uncloistered is a fish out of water. So what we're getting here is it's a comparison. So, and a cloister is where the monks stayed, right? So it's where they stayed. It's where they were supposed to stay and study and pray. So if we looked at a cloister as water, and then we looked at a monk, as a fish, then think about what he's saying here. That he didn't he didn't believe it was true that a monk on cloister was a fish out of water. So a fish out of water, let's think about that. A fish out of water is not in the right place, right? Because a fish is supposed to be in water. So if a fish is out of water, it's it's misplaced. It's going to die. Just like a monk on cloister, a monk who's not in his cloister is out of place. He's not where he's supposed to be. And not necessarily that he would die, but that maybe his um, his faith or his knowledge or um, what he was supposed to be doing, his obedience would, would be dying. So it's important to note that the monk is not saying a monk of cloisters is a fish out of water. He's saying that he doesn't write that text that are plucked in, meaning that he doesn't agree with that. Okay, now the next thing. Um, we're going to look at this. Um, all right, so this whole part right here, you have to notice that he says, and I agreed and said his views were sound. So whenever we're seeing all of these questions, these are the monk's views. This is what the monk thinks, and this is what the monk was saying. So the narrator is repeating the monk. So the narrator is repeating the monk here. So let's look at some of the questions that the monk would say. Am I to study until my head goes round, pouring over books and cloisters? Must I toil as Austin bad until the very soil? Was, am I to leave the world upon a shelf? So, um, whenever you're looking at this, he's saying, do I have to just sit around and study all the time? Do I have to do all of this work? And then when he says, leave the world upon a shelf, that means not have anything of this world. So, he's saying, I want things of this world. Just because I'm a monk, I'm not allowed to have it. So... What um, what you need to understand on this last little bit where it says Austin, let Austin have his labor to himself. Austin is St. Augustine. He criticized lazy monks. So whenever this monk says, let Austin have his labor to himself, he's talking about St. Augustine who criticized lazy monks. So he's basically saying, I'm not going to study. I'm not going to do all this manual labor. I want to have things of the world. Austin, yeah, if he wants to criticize me for not wanting to study and work, then he can just do it all himself. I'm not going to do it. So he's refusing to do the work that he's supposed to be doing as a monk. Okay, so the next thing that I'm going to point out is it says, Greyhounds he had, a swift as birds to course, hunting a hare or riding at a fence was all his fun he spared for no expense. So I want you to think about this. Go back to what we know about nuns and remember the fact that 
it kind of talks about in that page that y'all read Tuesday, it talks about how really a monk's pleasures and a monk's hobbies were not really supposed to be important. Like any of his hobbies should really be um, focused more on studying and learning and, be, and gaining more knowledge or um, something that would be beneficial. So really, whenever he's hunting a hare or riding at a fence, it was always fun. He spared for no expense. This is really, um, he is spending his time and money on hunting. So let's do spending time and money on hunting. And yes, he spends his time, but I know that he spends his money because it says he spared for no expense. And that means that, you know, he would put any kind of money into his hunting, which also breaks his veil of poverty. All right, so the last thing that we're going to look at, this whole last little bit, is focused mainly on his appearance. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of the details about his appearance, and we're going to think about what this tells us about the monk. All right, so let's look at, let's look at this. It says, that his sleeves were garnished at the hand with fine gray fur, the finest in the land. So if it's, it's not just fine gray fur, it's the finest in the land. So what do you know about fine gray fur, the finest in the land? It's going to be expensive. Okay, so that's breaking his vow of poverty. All right, next thing. It says, and to fasten at his chin, he had a wrought gold, cunningly fashioned pin, until a lover's knot that seemed to pass. So he has this gold pin that seems to pass into a lover's knot. Hmm, a lover's knot. Now, this makes us question it makes us question is this a romantic love that this is suggesting because the narrator the fact that the narrator chooses to tell us that it seems to pass into a lover's knot means that he is a little cynical of what's going on here like he looks at it hmm I think maybe um, I think maybe he is in some type of romantic relationship. All right, next thing. It says, um, well, I mean, there are other things, but I really want to focus on this next one. He was a fat and personable priest. So remember what we said about, um, remember what we said about being overweight. So the fact that he says, Fat. That kind of gives us a hint that he's wealthy, which what vow does that break? It, it breaks the vow of poverty. And the reason that being fat was a sign of wealth is because people in the Middle Ages really didn't have a whole lot of money. So they didn't have the money to be spending on a lot of nice food. And we can also pair this with he liked a fat swan best and roasted whole. That kind of goes into having that really good food. And the last thing I'm going to point out is this part right here where it says he was not pale like a tormented soul. Now, he was not pale. That just means like it may have had a little bit of a tan. Like he didn't look like he had been inside. And so the fact that it says like a tormented soul, meaning 
And he's not pale like he's been inside studying and working and copying manuscripts and praying and constantly doing work inside. So he, um, so what this is suggesting is that he has not been inside. Studying. Now, you could add other things like studying, praying, copying manuscripts, anything like that. But I'm just going to leave. He, he has not been inside studying. Instead, he's been, where's he been? He's been, he's been outside. He's been outside hunting. So, <coughs> so that kind of gives us an idea. All right, so for to go through the description of the monk, you can go back through and you can see the first thing that we pointed out is that hunting was his sport, but then the text said that hunters are not holy men. But he did not agree with that. He's breaking that vow of obedience because he's not following what the text says. Then we have in the blue box here, we have... In the blue box, we have that he just outright says, um, I ignore the rules of St. Bennett and St. Mar. Like, I don't, I don't really care what the rules they say. I don't have to follow them. Probably because he's a prior, he's reached that level of leadership that he can kind of make his own rules and not really have to follow the rules if he doesn't want to. Um, another thing that he did not rate that text to the plot 10, meaning another thing that he did not agree with, that is a monk and cloister is a fish out of water, because he didn't believe that he had to be in his cloister all the time. He didn't agree with that. He was he thought it was okay for him to be out and about in the world, having a good time, hunting, and kind of taking care of his hobbies. All right, what we have right here in this bracket is his views that he didn't need to study, he didn't need to work. He didn't need to leave the world upon the shelf and just not have anything in the world. So he wants things in the world. And then since Austin, St. Augustine criticized lazy monks and says, let Austin have his labor to himself. So that kind of goes back to, I'm not going to work. He can, he can criticize lazy monks all he wants. If he thinks that monks should work, let him work. But I'm not going to. That's kind of his attitude about it. Um, and then... He had the greyhounds that it says that he spared for no expense. So he's spending time and money hunting, which breaks his vow of poverty. It also breaks the vow, vow of obedience because um, part of the obedience is working and studying and worshiping and praying. And so he's spending his time and on his hobbies versus what he should have been doing. And then we have the sleeves garnished at the hand with fine gray fur, the finest in the land, which shows us it's expensive, breaking that vow of poverty again. Um, he was a fat and personable priest, since being overweight was a sign of wealth. That kind of gives us that idea. Plus, um, he, he liked the fat swan vest and roasted holes. So. Um, and then... The part where he is not pale like a tormented soul tells us that he was not inside studying, but he instead was outside hunting and having a good time instead of doing what he should have been doing. So you really, one thing I do want to point out from this is that you can go through and you can pick out a few things that the narrator doesn't think the, the monk is a bad person. Like he says stuff like he was one of the finest sort it says that he was a personable man. He says, I, in the narrator says, you know, I agreed with him. His, his views were sound. It made sense. And so the narrator says a few things that kind of show you that I mean, he, likes the, he likes the monk. The monk's a good guy. He just does not take his responsibilities as a monk seriously. He doesn't follow the rules.